brief survey of the doctrine of the Spirit. You remember this. It's the chart at the very beginning. I said that this would become an important chart. It would gather the information. It allows you to draw the conclusion that the Spirit is, contrary to what some teach, a very important person, not a mere impersonal force. You remember that there is, there are those who have denied the deity and the personality of the Spirit. That's to be expected on the part of certain groups where they've denied the Trinity anyway. For some, the Father created the Son, and the Son created the Spirit, who is not a person, but a force. You remember the terms for personality that are listed in your syllabus. Life, intellect, purpose, which implies freedom, spirit, of love, will, knowledge, all these apply to point to personality, as well as those actions that are done to persons and those actions that are done by persons. I gave you references for each of these. Also establishing clearly personality. You wouldn't expect a force, an impersonal force to be insulted <coughs> or to reprove. He's a person separately identifiable. Remember the reference, it seemed good to the Spirit and to us. Report in Acts 15, when he, Echinos, that one, John 16, 13, he'll glorify me and take of mine and disclose it to you. John 16, John 14, 15 and 16 contain a number of statements about the Spirit that he's Another comforter, a lost Paracletos, John 14, comforter of the same kind as Christ had been to his disciples. Divine attributes, I looked at them only from the standpoint of two, of greatness and of goodness. Eternality and all the omnis apply. You may assume that omnisapience also applies word we don't use very often, all wise. And of goodness, he's repeatedly, frequently referred to as the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Truth. However, you take all of the information under personality, you take all of the information of actions done by and done to, take out your separately identifiable person and the divine attributes and you put them on your if and then chart. That evidence fits in here, okay, at different levels. Things about personality. Okay, in the one block, actions done by and to in the next, separately identifiable, and there you would talk about the masculine pronoun as well, divine attributes. Identification with God is to be expected, and it is when you cross-reference with the Old Testament. What is spoken of in the New Testament is the Spirit speaking, and the Old Testament turns out to be Yahweh. And then you should expect to find that divine work is being done. And it is creating, inspiring, striving, gifting, illumining. And all his doings with believers in the growth of the church, in salvation, regeneration, sanctification, etc. All those can be identified. So that's an important consideration for you. Those facts in the sections that follow come back and fit in to their little if-and-then chart. 
we can take some selected actions here, yes, sealing and baptizing. Certainly the Spirit is the guarantee, the pledge, the earnest. Seal speaks of preservation and security. It also points clearly to ownership and protection. You now belong to God, who by his initiative has taken action. And so protected by the power of God would be an excellent cross-reference in First Peter. Ephesians 1 and 4 and 2 Corinthians 2 and 5 would be your main references for sealing. Got a lengthy, repetitive article by Woodcock that dri drives it home for you. Baptizing, you've defined as placed into the body, an act that is reserved for the New Testament believer, since the body of Christ could not exist in actuality until he had come, risen from the dead, departed in the ascension, sent the Holy Spirit. There are special incidents in the book of Acts that tie what happens back to Pentecost by virtue of the tongues that were spoken. This is just like that. It actually highlights the significance of Pentecost. That's also an important consideration in thinking about the Old Testament saints. Spirit baptism has often been viewed in parallel fashion to water baptism, it's uh, in order to understand what's going on. It's not that water baptism and spirit baptism are the same or that water baptism pictures only spirit baptism or that spirit baptism can't occur before water baptism or only occurs after or anything like that. It's to help understand. So you have the baptizer, the element in which the baptizing is done, the baptized, the condition that calls for the baptism, the mode of that and the result. The result for water baptism, looking at these, of course, the baptizer would be the pastor, the element would be water, the baptized would be you, the believer. The condition is only that, that there is a profession of faith in Christ. The mode would be undoubtedly immersion well established. You probably know that the word baptize came into the English language as a result of transliterating baptizo in the Greek New Testament because the translators of the King James were not too happy about putting immersion. And the result for water baptism would be I've publicly indicated that I've been identified with Christ in his death, burial and resurrection and that God has saved. Spirit baptism, however, you can take these six and you realize the baptizer is Christ. The element is the spirit and you can look at the use of the preposition in and so on and it's not instrumentality. It's immersion into the spirit. It is the sense of deluged, inundated with. You are the believer. The only condition is faith. And the result of Christ being the one that baptizes you in the spirit into his body is exactly that, into the body of Christ. Very particular result that couldn't belong to the saints before this time. Yeah. With regard to uh, the baptizer, number one, you had mentioned that the pastor would be that person. Yeah, I should say pastor, et al. Adult? Et al. and others. Okay, and, and, and others. Would you, would that be um, viewed as uh, an ordinance to be done within the church exclusively, or would you say that's open? No, oh, that's interesting. One doesn't want to be too sort of legalistic. Obviously, it's a good idea to do it in the church before the body of believers. But 
I mean, it can be done in public too. The riverside and the lakeside, in fact, this is done in a number of places in order to have something of a public proclamation. Would it therefore be done only by uh, leadership in the church? Or? No, because we are not sacramentally oriented. If you're sacramentally oriented, you demand that the pastor or an ordained elder do the baptizing, but I, I see no problem with if, if a man in the church leads somebody to Christ, why he shouldn't do the baptizing. It's traditionally not done. Mm -hmm. It's usually pastoral staff, and, and that's fine, so long as you don't give the impression that it doesn't take if it's not done by an ordained pastor. That would, that would not be correct. And for some churches it's it's really a good evangelistic thing. I, the first time I was in a public one, I, rem I remember the impact of it. It was at a swimming pool. I can't, can't remember where it was, way out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, I can't remember which country it was. It was a foreign country, I know that. And it, it was done in the swimming pool, and it was amazing how many people hung around to see what was going on. Uh, it was in another public one that was in Ireland that was done at the local swimming pool as well. And it, there were a, a number of people that asked quite a few questions afterwards because in a Catholic environment they couldn't understand what was going on. You've got indwelling and filling. Taking up residence and abiding in forever you, you probably could define that as the abiding presence of the Spirit. We usually use the preposition in in order to catch the sense of indwelling. We realize this is a post-Pentecost only. It's, so baptism and indwelling have direct relationships to the body and to Christ having come. Filling of the Spirit in our notes, you realize that it's looking at Luke and Acts, which of course has the bulk of the instances for filling of the Spirit. Two different words are used that relate to these two categories you see on the screen special fillings. and fullness or repetitive fillings fullness that is characterized by the control of the spirit special f fillings would be pimplemi pimplemi in all of its references points to something special and fullness which is the use of play rays Pleiroo points to something that is not restricted to a special task. Special fillings deal with temporary empowerment for a particular task locked into a particular situation. And the caution you must exercise when talking about special fillings is not to see this as having direct application to the contemporary church. There may be special empowerment that God might give at some time, special fullness, but you don't have the same emphasis on the fullness, plerais, disposition characterized by the Spirit's control I put under the control of the Spirit and then put a dash and said ongoing. This is an ongoing. Maybe I could, instead of the word ongoing, because that may give the idea of durative, you know, going on and on. There's two other words that could be used in place. <coughs> what would they be? What would be a better way of describing under the control of? Rather than saying ongoing, which would be durative, you could use another two words. Either one would be applicable. Actually, three. Continuous. 
I didn't get it. Continuing? Well, it continues, but it obviously isn't as as me being fully under the control of the Spirit every day as I should be. Chris? You look for another word instead of under control of Instead of ongoing. How we use what yielded to the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> yeah. Yielded, but I'm looking for replacing ongoing, which I said was durative, and durative may not be the right idea because you do not always exhibit full control of the Spirit over your life. Well, vitalized. Vitalized. Yeah, I'd, I'd never heard that word used. Can it be sanctifying? Process? Well, even the sanctifying is sort of an up and down thing, isn't it? I, I don't, I'm not always living at this level of real maturity all the time. So I'm looking for repetitive or frequentative would be better words. Something that suggests it's not continuing in a straight line as fully under the control of. Then you would bring in yielded obedience submission to truth striving to walk in a sanctified way, asking for help. The top priority for the believer is fullness. I, need, I want to be characterized by the Spirit's control in my daily walk. Not just in terms of the giftedness for doing something, which, which in part may fall under special filling, but in, in terms of exhibiting holiness of conduct, there would be fullness of control. And if you read the article by, what was his name, Kost, Kostenberger, you remember that he emphasized that this is a matter of control. After looking at the Old Testament, he comes to Ephesians 5, and sees it as coming under the influence of being under the control of. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You, you follow so far what's going on. Special filling. You can see that. I don't know if I gave this to you. We probably didn't. Let's see if we can switch to this. <coughs> Bottom two paragraphs. Appropriate attitudes and abilities which gradually develop in one who responds willingly to the Spirit. Obviously there's a level of obedience. The Spirit's indirect oversight of his circumstances and experience, experiences <coughs> applicable to any relevant situation. That's his concise definition of fullness after examining every text in the Old and the New Testament that had the word fulfilling. Special fillings are sudden, sovereign, unexpected, overwhelming, incident-oriented acts of enablement <coughs> Undefined as to duration, lasting as long as its purpose and situation demand, sometimes having verbal proclamation. There's a good definitions from his dissertation. Part, part of the definition is given in the syllabus. Special fillings would be these. Be great in the sight of the Lord, will be filled with the Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Elizabeth was filled. Acts 2, speaking in other tongues for that particular period of time, related to what was going on at Pentecost. Peter, 
spoke to the rulers and elders of the people. It was a particular unction, anointing, a special presence of the Spirit that gave him the authority to stand up to speak and the boldness to speak. Saul, similar situation, filled with the Spirit. You'll have to sit and think your way through the context to catch the sense of incident-oriented, historically locked in. Fullness, play raise and play roho. Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned, was led by the Spirit. Select among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And they selected a man full, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. This was obviously a, a disposition that characterized Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, and the men that were chosen as leaders. Similar comments in Acts 11 and Acts 13. Durative or ongoing or repetitive or frequentative. Maybe a failure at some point but then a return to what should be. Okay. Let's take this a step further. This is the chart you had decided not to do the chart on the screen but just to fill it out like this I said I was going to give you a copy of that chart and I'll get it done for you or did you get it? you didn't this particular one remember the categories time, the people and so on I took this information and put it onto the screen Starting at about 30 AD, and it is probably true to observe that there was no obvious public, at least important event, public event, that needed revelation after 54 AD. These were particular events. To make them easy to remember, I called it the day of the day of Pentecost with Jews, then the day or the hour with the Samaritans, with the Gentiles and with John's disciples. And interesting events. Circumstances are different. You'll notice that the red on the right, they were actually obeying a command to stay in one place until the promise of the Father would come upon them. There was the laying on of the apostles' hands that did this. While Peter was preaching, it just happened. And there was Paul's hands that were laid upon the disciples. You'll notice they're speaking in tongues in three instances. Maybe it also took place with the Samaritans in Acts 8, but it's not recorded. Perhaps that's underneath the signs. So you can override and say tongues is seemingly a common experience but in each case Jews were present. Is that significant or isn't it? No apparent fixed pattern to follow, I probably should have the word fixed in there, that says it will follow this exact order and water baptism can occur after or before spirit baptism, at least in these particular incidents. There's only one reference in Paul's letters, Ephesians 5. There are a number of elements to it. It's a continual priority that's obvious from the words in the text itself, present passive be filled with the Spirit. It is something that should be of concern to the believer that this be so. The context indicates the evidence that will be there 
of being filled in the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, etc. I think you have to go all the way down to chapter 6 and verse 9. By that time, every major relationship of life has been taken into account. If you're going to preach on verse 18, you've got to pick up at verse 15 to catch the whole unit in which it stands. There is a corporate dimension too to that. That's one of the things that Kirsten, you must have noticed it, one of the things that Kirsten Berger emphasized towards the end of his article was the corporate dimension. You, you all caught that? And, and the reason why I'm asking is because invariably when we think about filling of the Spirit, we think in terms of individual. Okay? We don't think in terms of corporate. I mean, the corporate dimension may come up, but the emphasis usually is me and you, the individual believer. Notice what I put down in your notes issue is control in the lives of believers under a good influence, that is, and the evidence is wise and righteous living. So obviously the fruit of the Spirit is going to be there. Grateful corporate worship, verses 19 through 20. That's a corporate dimension. Ethically sound relationships in all areas of life, as far as husbands and wives and wives as husbands, parents and children, masters and servants, is a good impact upon those relationships. So Kustenberger says this corporate dimension to being filled with the Spirit is often inadequately recognized in a the theology of a Spirit-filled life that deals primarily with me, privately. You'll notice that he also brought out, and you can bring it out with comparison to Colossians 3, that the word filled life and the spirit filled life are mutually inclusive, if I may put it that way. Why? Well, the answer is so simple. It's a rhetorical question. Why? Because the Word of God indicates clearly the quality of life. And getting that into your life is the work of the Spirit, challenging, admonishing, strengthening, encouraging, using the implanted Word that is able to sanctify. So the Spirit-filled individual will be Word-filled. The one who submits to the Word He's going to be spiritful. That's a genuine believer without ulterior motives, just really wanting to please the Lord in every respect. Can I ask a question? You certainly can. Where it says, Be filled with the Spirit in Colossians, where it says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. The argument that Paul uses those terms interchangeably. It's, it's <coughs> not that the words are interchangeable, but the concept is interchangeable. The person who is submitting to the Word, obeying that Word out of a genuine desire to please the Lord by putting into his life what God has revealed is, is the ethics and morals that we should live by. The Spirit, using that Word in his life, will make him a Spirit-filled individual. Okay. So it's not the words that are interchangeable, it's the concept is there. It is impossible for a... Now, I'll be dogmatic and say it's impossible for a man to be filled with the Spirit and have no relationship to the Word of God. Okay? He will submit to the Word of God and vice versa. It is impossible to look at a man who's really living according to the Word and say he's not Spirit-filled. Okay? Peter? Like you're, you're saying also, I mean, even in concept, they're not 
interchangeable the way you the way you said that the spirit will take the word. It's like they're connected and they both go together, but they're not exactly interchangeable. There's somewhat yeah. like there's a close relationship between the two. You can't just they, they switch sure the two. There is a close relationship. Right. But you can't switch the two conceptually yeah, or Yeah, remember what we said that the spirit works with the word? Right through the word and never without the word right. and, and that's your connection right. but they're not interchangeable right even in concept they're, they're connected both well they're so closely connected right. yeah that's why i use the word interchangeable the, the words it's not the words it's the obvious connection between the spirit and the word so the description of the individual can be given both ways but you, yeah. but you were saying there, there's, in a sense, almost an order, like the Spirit will take the Word, right, and then apply it. Well, there, there would be, the, the person who's doing that which is right is living according to truth, isn't he? Right. How does he live according to truth? What is it that convinces him that this truth is something he must live by and asks for the strength to be able to do that? the result is going to be the Spirit, who is the other comforter, that will be working with that word in his life. So you, you, if you have the Spirit, you have the word. If you have the word, you have the Spirit. So they, but, uh, I'm just kidding. I guess I'm getting confused on that, that word interchangeable. Because I see the relationship between the two. I don't see how... Well, I'm using interchangeable to cover the. It's, close it's so close, yeah. Okay. There's a obvious submission to truth and a real desire to have as a priority in life walking according to the Spirit. They, they're, all, they're hard to define, but what it comes to is yieldedness, submission, obedience, desire to please, aspiration to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. That would also be a close linkage. doesn't say anything about the Spirit, but that aspiration to show grace the graciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ obviously is going to be connected to the Spirit's working. I couldn't do it by myself at all. Let's put up some impediments. The opposite of yieldedness and obedience is self-reliance. Self-exaltation, self-will. I don't need anybody else's help. I can live according me. I can live according to the standards by my own strength. Self-exaltation would be somebody who's dipped too much into psychology and is locked into self-esteem and um, I'm the important individual, nobody else. Servant attitude is gone. Self-will, which simply says the same thing as the previous two. So you could draw the conclusion that there, there could be a loss of fullness. In fact, there undoubtedly will be. Because a self-willed, self-reliant, self-exalting individual and a self-assertiveness doesn't exhibit humbleness. So there's a loss of fullness, but there's no loss of the spirit. In fact, what word applies here? I should have put it as a little overlay right there. There is a proud individual God is never pleased with anyway. But what, what are you doing to the Spirit? If there's loss of fullness, but no loss of the Spirit in your life, there's no sense in which the Spirit departs. Yeah, grieving, quenching, <coughs> insulting. All that would apply. And there would be immaturity and, con and carnality. It'd be a loss of being characterized by truth. 
walking in the truth. That would be a, another good parallel to draw from Sir John, walking in the truth. You look at, I don't want to give a sermon here, but I thought it might be instructive just to think about this very special invitation in Ephesians 5. I think they're two instructive contrasts dealing with separation from the world. So that starts at verse 15. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It's a separated lifestyle that he's talking about. There's the double ethic, ethically instructive contrast in verses 15 through 17. And then there's the doctrinally instructive contrast in verses 18 through 21. I think that's one way to do it. You can outline it any way you want to. There's no inspired way to outline a particular text, as long as you follow the text. You can pick up on the doctrinally instructive contrast. You set the stage with verses 15 through 17, then you have your initial prohibition. Don't come under the wrong influence. Do not get drunk with wine that is under the control of something so that you end up doing what you would never do in normal circumstances. For that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. You need to see the fruit of wrong influence, dissipation. Special invitation is given. I've called it a very special invitation. But be filled with the Spirit. Took the disjunctive in the sentences, cutting it into the initial prohibition and the special invitation, do come under the best influence, which is obviously the Spirit of God in the Word, and see in your life the fruit, or recognize the fruit of this best influence and control. And that would be verses 19 following. Take it a little further. If you look at the fruit of this best influence and control, you can describe the rest of the passage in these terms. Interpersonal sanctification, edification flourishes. I think that's an indication of being filled with the Spirit. That there is personal edification, encouragement, building up one another. There's a personal adoration for God that certainly does arise, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. There's certainly personal gratitude to God that also occurs. But that spills back into interpersonal non-discrimination slash subordination that flourishes. It's good fruit. Good sign of control and influence. Now I gave you in your notes... An excursus. Not sure what page it is for you. An excursus dealing with the spirit. Fifty four good. A couple of things to note. And I'm going to let you read through the excursus by yourself. The break point that we've already alluded to is Pentecost. There's a very significant day in biblical history. Okay. Before then, it was different. After Pentecost, it is totally unlike the Old Testament. But there is a similarity that stretches across Pentecost, across the ages, notwithstanding the loose comments of some of our earlier dispensational brethren. And that is regeneration. Saved by grace through faith. With God's initiative in carrying out his electing work from before the foundation of the world. 
That remains the same for Old Testament saint and New Testament saint. I've lost that page in my syllabus. There's a syllogism you can put together as you consider the before and the after of Pentecost. That is a syllogism that is saying there is no difference except baptism of the Spirit. Recognize that baptism of the Spirit is unique. So the major premise would just simply be Old Testament saints were regenerated. That's obvious. The minor premise would be that indwelling is necessary to regeneration. Okay? And so the simple conclusion is therefore Old Testament saints were indwelt. That's given by many. Indwelling belongs to the Old Testament saint. However, you can take it further. If you think carefully about baptism into the body and what that entails and the connection with the indwelling of the Spirit that is part and parcel of what happens to the New Testament believer, your syllogism will be different be expanded and amended it's in your notes major premise is that the indwelling of the saints is for those saints of adult status not a slave not a child you'd have to read through Galatians 4 3 and 4 to pick up the distinctive markers temporal and causal clauses until the time appointed you are sons now God sent forth his spirit. You're talking about an economy of salvation in Galatians 3. So the indwelling of the saint belongs to the time of adoption, which comes after Christ has come. The Old Testament saint was therefore a minor until Christ and adoption. I don't want you to think of minor as less quality in regeneration. Okay. In terms of the economy and the breakpoint of Pentecost, the Old Testament saint was not in the body, not adopted into the family in the same way as the New Testament believer. The conclusion, therefore, is that the Old Testament saint doesn't qualify for indwelling by virtue of where he lived, although he's still saved by grace through faith. There will never be any change in that. There'll still be a recognition, I think, in the eternal state of the different believers. And it, it will be it will redound to the glory of God's sovereignty. It'll not be a sense of loss. Poor me, I lived before the cross. Wonderful me, I lived after the cross. That obviously is going to be completely removed. It'll be, look what God has done through the ages. I don't... Yeah. Yeah, this always raises a number of questions, I know. Chris? I, I don't understand and, uh, what you're saying, but um, as far as the Old Testament believer, that he wasn't in, I know you're saying that he wasn't indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but if we hold to total depravity and they're saved by grace through faith, then. How do they have faith in order to believe? I didn't remove the Spirit from their life at all. I didn't say they, had, they didn't have the work of the Spirit. There's obviously an abiding presence. There's obviously the work of the Spirit with the Word that they did have in their lives. There's obviously the Spirit's work in sanctification but that special relationship of the indwelling spirit to me as it relates to the body of Christ is not an Old Testament thing. But an abiding presence, yes. But an abiding presence in terms of indwelling, and you'll see that as we move on, is, is different. The spirit's still obviously vitally involved because you said exactly why. Sinful men need the help of the Word of God and the Spirit of God to grow. And there is the regenerating work of the Spirit as well. 
Uh, my question is, how do we, like, we use different prepositions, but in John, if I was to he is with you someday, he will be in you. How are we to understand, like, those prepositions in or with? I mean, it's obviously, I mean, as far as I understand, I don't think it's talking about necessarily an ontological relationship. I mean, like, there's no physical dwelling. Um, so how, how do we understand that? Let me, let me find for you a good quote that covers that. I was reading it this morning. Here we are, from Homer Kent. Why I noticed it is because Homer Kent is one of, one of my heroes and mentor alongside of Whitcomb. This is in his little book, Light in the Darkness, Studies in the Gospel of John says here in talking about meta para n study of these prepositions he says the interpreter must beware however of downgrading the relationship of the spirit to men expressed by with you par human and suppose that this relation would be replaced by that of being n human in you must be noted that the same preposition para is used to describe the present relation of the Father and the Son to believers when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, 1423. One must avoid making too sharp a distinction between these prepositions and at the same time not minimize the importance of Pentecost. He's try to strike a careful position. It's obvious that there is that which relates to the future with the Spirit. And it's after Pentecost. So the Spirit has come at Pentecost to perform a work on mission for Christ that he was not doing beforehand. It's a, it's a brand new event in world history. So when, when we speak about being in you, we are talking about a very special abiding presence that belongs to the one who has been baptized into the body of Christ and who, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead, and who himself and the body to which he belongs is indwelt by the Spirit. But that body the Old Testament saints didn't belong to. You'll have to look your way through Galatians 3. I don't want to take the time to step through it. But notice the significant markers and change that's occurring. There's an economy of salvation being expressed. Beforehand, they were under the law, held captive, child, slave with a pedagogos, Afterwards, they are sons adopted into God's family. The Spirit's relationship to them is, therefore, maybe I'll put it like this, more intense. More, I don't even like that word. There's an abiding presence that we speak of as indwelling. For the Old Testament saint, we'll speak of an abiding presence that helps, that convicts, that strengthens, that enables not only the prophets to function, but the godly men to live godly lives, such as Daniel and other sensitivity to sin and so on. Somebody over here have a hand? Dex. So are you expressing with that slide where Old Testament saint is a minor until the Christ and adoption? Because the Old Testament saint, by definition, was before Christ and the adoption. Is there a latency or a, or a uh, I don't know, where they were looking forward to that? In, in yeah, I'm using the word minor in the sense that they are spoken of as being s slave and child huh? un under certain restriction. So you're not talking about potential or latency, you're talking no, more about? No, I'm talking about, I mean, they could live very godly lives. But the dispensation, the economy of salvation in which they lived was before the cross and Pentecost. Okay? 
And that's what Galatians 3 is bringing out. And that's why it explodes into adoption in chapter 4. But I think you have to speak in such a way. That's why I'm, I'm kind of wishing I hadn't used the word minor. Right? But there was a space problem on the screen. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to use another line. Because I, I did hesitate and try to think of something else. Minor describes economy <coughs> as opposed to son adopted into the family. It doesn't describe, I mean, some of the Old Testament saints had a remarkable wisdom of God and a godliness of life. Joseph, for example, that tells you that there has to be the Spirit's involvement in their lives. Otherwise they couldn't live. But you have to take it a little further. You've got to go to what I call temple metaphors in the spirit. They are the individual texts, or sometimes texts taken as being individual. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. In most systematic theologies, is usually just dropped in the parentheses behind the statement about individual indwelling. But there is a plural verb that is used and plural pronoun este in human and descriptions in the contexts that do suggest a corporateness and the metaphor is collective rather than individual I'm gonna if you don't mind we'll take a break in a few minutes I'd like to finish this year so we don't stop in the middle you have a collective, corporate metaphor in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. It is the community of the believers that is the temple. And the number of commentaries back that up. So God dwells in them corporately, among them. And that's interesting about the warning on corrupting the body of believers with false device of doctrine. You bring false doctrine into the church, you meddling with that group, that corporate body that is indwelt by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 probably points to individuality, perhaps a subtle overlapping with corporateness, but there's the singular, the body, followed by the plural pronoun, in your body, probably a stress on individual indwelling, maybe with an underlying sense of community and I'm trying not to create a synthesis here because you're not sure what to do. Second Corinthians six sixteen, collective statement again points to corporateness. So you have individual texts, corporate texts, and individual believers perhaps being seen as the building materials. They are, not perhaps. They are seen as the building materials. It is the habitation of God in the Spirit, such as in Ephesians 2. They form one new body, one new man. They are God's household. They are the whole building. They are the non, the temple of which they are a body still under construction. So they are the temple, the living stones, making up that particular body. That's the temple metaphor usually taken as referring to the universal church it's this body of believers from the time of Pentecost <coughs> to the time of the rapture but you take it further you have the individual believer that has the abiding presence of the spirit within and he is part of the universal church got to put that up universal church and I'm in it but what's missing that obviously should be there that is used by the Spirit of God that is the community to which I belong there's the local church so those three concentric circles you have on page 58 what's been expressed spirit dwells in the church 
universal, obviously by extension in the church local, and in the individual believer who makes up the genuine element of the local church and indeed the only elements or members of the universal church. It's, a, it's at the local church level that you get a certain degree of confusion arising because men and women can come into the local church who are not genuine believers and disturb, disturb the fellowship. The true believer is indwelt and the true believer is the only one that's a member of the universal church and that's why we try to make as sure as possible that the local church reflects the universal unless I follow a different theology where the relationship between local and universal is different. Holy Spirit dwells within all three. That's why I think that indwelling is so special post-Pentecost. Given you a chart that I believe was put together by Alva McLean years ago, indwelling, baptism, filling, fleshing out the information for you in chart form. It's for your interest. Add, add to the file. I'll be giving you a copy of this explanatory sheet and the chart of baptisms in Acts. You don't need to take this down, but I should remind you at this point that there is those historic errors on the Holy Spirit, denial of personality by Paul of Samosota in the third century. No, he's a force. No personality at all. So Sinus, founder of modern day Unitarianism, would be similar. There's also those who deny deity. That's to be expected, I mentioned at the beginning. Arius denied the deity of the Spirit. He declared that the Father created the Son, then the Son created the Spirit. I was incorrect earlier. A person but not God. It was not the denial of a personality. It was the denial of deity. When you think about Jehovah's Witness today, it's a combination of Socinianism on the Spirit and Arianism on the Son. Think about it. Son is created, therefore not the eternal God, and the Spirit is a force, a power of God, not a person. So expect certain adjustments to take place in the persons of the Trinity when there's a denial of the Trinity. We may talk about the filling of the Spirit in terms of practical conditions and responsibilities. And you may cross-reference to a number of verses to set these up. They will be different as you read different books. Do not quench the Spirit by resisting and saying no. It will be yielding to the Spirit. And even that, you struggle to give final definition. Do not grieve the Spirit. That's obvious by living a life like the unsaved. You need to confess your sins. <coughs> Keep a short account with God in that respect. Galatians 5. Do walk by Him and His standards. That's by depending upon the Spirit. There will be an attitude of prayer, seeking for strength to live right. Have new habits come into your life. Colossians 3. Do fill yourself with God's Word. That's absorbing. I use those terms. Yield, confess, depending, absorbing. It's encouraging for me to read the Word of God and to say I do have the Spirit as the helper for life and service. It should be encouraging. But it's demanding. Since the Spirit occupies my body, 
I must attend to the condition of it, the location of it, the occupation of it, how I care for it, where I take it, how I use it. It's worth thinking about. Usually, the whole idea of fullness is set up with certain steps like this. Don't do this, do this. And they're fine because you can find those verses in Scripture. So you can put them together in some way to get people to understand what they need to do. But let me ask you a question. Can I know, me, you individually, can I know that I'm spirit-filled? Okay, sure. You, you, we do compare ourselves with Scripture. <coughs> Maybe as little less infrequently than we should. Yeah, Nathan. Um, I don't know what it would be, but there must be some way because we're commanded to be filled by the Spirit, so there has to be a way to gauge that. Right. No, that, that's exactly right. It's not... It's what it's done to me. You be filled with the Spirit. It's not an action that I do, right? So, but there must be some evidence of Spirit filling. And, and there was a correct statement here. There is a comparison to truth because there will be the Word. The uh, presence of the fruit of the Spirit in the life of the believer? I think that's probably the clearest than not. The fruits, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians. And I would go to Second Peter 1. Are these things increasing in you? Are you being all diligent to add to your faith, godliness, etc.? Self-control. You know as well as I do that self-control requires dependence and prayer and asking for God's help and strength in the inner man. There is the ability to worship gratefully, the concern for the fellow believer. But uh, in asking the question, I've also got in mind the fact that it is unlikely that the spiritful man is going to stand up and tell me Spirit filled. Because what is that going to violate? Humility. Right. Humility and self effacement. One of the one of the evidences of godliness is humility. Yes, Ashley. Would it be correct to say that someone could look back and see that what they were doing was beyond their own abilities, would that be it? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Hindsight is often helpful to see how God strengthened and guided. Obviously, we were in, under the control of the Spirit because of what happened. Yeah. But currently today, I think the genuine believer that is striving after righteousness would probably say that he's trying to live a godly life he would not say i am a godly man because that sounds like i've arrived passed the test a plus don't need to do any more work never speak like that but certainly the fruits fruit of the Spirit and the trays or the hallmarks of a believer will be seen and there will be maturity but I was, I was mentioning to Peter at the break something to always take into account particularly as a pastor I guess warning for ourselves it is possible because of sheer habit over years of indoctrination and living within a certain group that you can project the image 
of being somebody that I would look at and say, there goes a mature believer. There goes a spiritual man. And then later on it comes out that this was a facade. Okay? That's part, part of the problem of dealing with believers in the local church who are not genuine believers. But it grew up in the right environment. Know the language, know the actions. We all have horror stories and the older you get, the more you hear of genuine believers whom you thought were genuine, who were not. Obviously never full of the Spirit. Joyfulness, thankfulness, glorifying of the Lord Jesus, walking in truth. Those are the marks that others see, not necessarily you with the proviso of looking back, seeing how God has worked. But be encouraged. You're not being left alone to live the life by yourself. But pick up the demanding challenge too. Got to be careful what I do. Okay. Now next time we come, I want to pick up on a unit that's not in your notes, which will be the gifts of the Spirit. But for now, I'd like you to turn to page 59, I think it is. And if we can go through this quickly, the charismatic <coughs> overview, because there's certainly a misunderstanding of the Spirit in the life of the believer and the church in charismatic circles. This is, for those of you in the charismatic theology class, this is a rerun on a more concise level. Contribute wherever you can. In fact, I should just call upon you, say a few things. Burgeoning movement surging all over the world especially in the last 10 years with its own theological literature of sophisticated written by highly educated men there's what I've called significant theological breakpoints by which I mean that when you submit this movement to analysis it obviously breaks from evangelicalism, although it may think of itself as in, we're going to have to draw the conclusion that it is, in many respects, out. I think there's a four-question frame of reference that can be proposed to understand the charismatic movement. I think you can put their doctrines basically into four questions, although there is a fifth one starting to form in my own thinking. Four basic emphases. In every one of these that we'll ask, the prominent ager or activator, agent activator or enabler or empowerer, those words are used, is the Holy Spirit whose working is not to be questioned or rejected. I know God deals with me. Don't tell me that you know or can pass any judgment on that. Four questions are these. Are the works of Jesus to be reduplicated in the church today? Must I find being done in my ministry what Jesus did in his? Okay. It's, a, it's a thing that drove Wimber and a number of the others. Got to find the evidence in what my ministry is in my local church. Miraculous power such as Jesus demonstrated in his. The second question is, are apostles and prophets being restored to the church today? And for the most part, the modern charismatic will say, yes. He may do some hasty redefining of an apostle, but it's basically a yes. Is special revelation still taking place today? He would answer, yes. And must we enjoy health and wealth today? 
But are these works to be reduplicated? Here's the basics. Signs and wonders of the apostles basically never ceased. If they don't occur, you are not doing evangelism. I mean, that's, that's it. That's the bottom line. Words plus works equals a kingdom message. Words alone, not sufficient. Works alone, not sufficient. Words accompanied by works equals the kingdom message that God intends us. Kingdom message, of course, being gospel. The accusation that accompanies this usually is that the church is weak and failing because it has lost the power of the Spirit through disobedience, through incrustation with relic and ritual and ceremony. So all the things have become just sort of done for the sake of being done. One of the things you'll find in most of these movements, like the charismatic movement, is an accusation against the church. Of course, you must criticize the church if you want to make your point. We are like the early church. God is restoring through us the power, the success of the early church, just like the book of Acts. So the gifts either have continued or they stopped for some reason have now come back but it's never the gifts have ceased period okay. if they talk about a cessation it's because they want to emphasize the loss of spirit's power to various reasons in fact I'm going to give you a, a chart that shows the collapse of the church to about 1200 AD and then the steady climb back up to this period of time where God is now using certain churches and individuals to restore the church to what it was before. Important dynamic for them is Jesus' immutability. The same yesterday and today and forever. Meaning, if he performed works yesterday, he will perform works today because he's the same. So cessationism somehow destroys the immutability of Christ. Okay? That's where the argument is going. They do believe in the believer's greater works. Greater work, that is, greater miracles. We will do things amazing. They, they want to see the signs and wonders and great miracles because it is a display of being granted the right to do that which is much greater. Not spiritual, nothing related to the preaching of the gospel, actual miracles. The working model for them is Elijah and Baal, 1 Kings 18, challenging the false gods in some way and God coming out as the victor. And that becomes the important consideration. Let's see God victorious over the pagan powers in more than the rescue of a soul from damnation. Okay, any comments? You guys that are in it? If you, if you can remember anything? No. Yeah. It's interesting that they select the model of Elijah and Baal because if you follow the story through, the, the response of the people was very temporal, and they ended up all falling away, and Elijah had to go and flee by himself. You, know, you don't look too far down the context because that <laughs> may undo the statement you make. You just pointed out a serious problem: contextual exegesis, contextual analysis is really done. In fact, take this. Take some time to watch somebody on one of those channels, would you? I don't know how many of you have done it. And observe the hop, skip, and the jump from Genesis to Revelation to Matthew to Haggai to Acts. It is an amazing correlation of verses, correlation of verses from 
all different genre, just plucked out and used to make a point. Kref Dola does that, his wife does that, and a number of others. It's exactly the way they preach. It, it is an amazing hermeneutic. It is, it is what you call a stringing of verses together. So that if you try to criticize, it becomes almost difficult to do so. Because they have taken this verse, fitted that one in, then this one, then that one, then this one, until they've got a chain, a string of verses. That's their exegesis. It's like fitting together a sausage. You know, stuffing it in and tying a knot, stuffing the next verse in and tying a knot. If you've ever seen folks making a sausage with stomach gut, <laughs> you clean it out first. But uh, when I've seen it done, it actually helped in it. And that's the picture you get. This guy's got this. Next one. Next one. And then they lay it out at the end. And everybody is wowed by the fantastic ability to tie verses of scripture together and deceiving the flock. Set up the models, set up the dynamics, set up the formula, express the desire. We will be the triumphant early church. Restored. Restorationism being the main element in their teaching. Are apostles and prophets being restored to the church today? We'll say no. Why do we say no? What's the basic response from you immediately? Current charismatic theology class cannot respond. Absolutely. We, we instinctively realize from if we, even if we can't quote Ephesians, we instinctively realize from the teaching we've had and the reading we've done in Scripture that this is foundational stage. Stuff. Apostles and prophets were at the bottom. They were the foundation, Ephesians 2 and 3, and you can't get away from it. They have apostles and prophets functioning like this. If this is a building, here's the apostles and prophets superstructure, now restoration age, meaning we're at the roof stage, replaced, foundation becomes roof. So apostles and prophets at the bottom, apostles and prophets at the top. Man, we get this world ready for the coming of Christ. There's steady movement away from premillennialism, though many of them were premill. It's to that stage now where we cap the church. There are apostolic churches today. Three books out on the different churches that have been identified. They call themselves churches with an apostolic ministry. And some men are being called the apostles. For now you realize it's sort of a small a. But you wonder how long before it's going to become we are the restored apostle. Capital A. Church has showed a steady decline. Time of restoration needed. But notice the point here under additional thesis. Restorationism is accompanied by one other thing. That the anointed of God, that is the man with the apostolic ministry, prophetic ministry, will now unlock the biblical truths that have been dormant for a long time. Things you should have learned and have never learned finally will be brought to your attention because God will open up what has been shut for all these years through the ministry of this particular individual. Now you have the truth. Interesting, isn't it? And people believe it. Yes, Jeff. I think a lot of this is motivated by experience. Uh, having an experience so that yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, like you said, backwoods kind of stuff, unverifiable things that happen, but everybody wants to have that kind of an experience. And, um, you know, today, I mean, I've known people who have been caught up in it who have 
have come out of that and say that they've even, you know, tried to, you know, speak in tongues and tried to fake it just so that they would have this experience. And it just seems like a lot of the motivation behind it is experience, experiential. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. I'm going to show you this. Don't laugh at my wife. She was trying to help me when I was talking to her about this. I said, I can't draw. And, and I'm not very good at getting stuff off the internet. I need something that shows apostles and prophets building apostles and prophets. So she was sitting at her desk for a little while and she came back with this. When you see in the library, either say nothing or say good job. <laughs> apostles and prophets equals the foundation. Here we are, somewhere there. Apostles and prophets equals the final foundation, the final roof, the top, the crown, the victorious triumphant achievement or something. That's the idea that's in mind. I think we have to think like this. Foundation of apostles and prophets with their accompanying signs plus closure of the canon. With the shutdown of the revelatory gifts equals the church is weaned. Scripture is sufficient to teach on its structure and mission. Let's take the end up. It no longer needs prophetic revelation it no longer needs fresh revelation from God. That's interesting given this. Notice Jack Deere's opening sentence. In, in order to fulfill God's highest purpose for our lives, we must be able to hear his voice both in the written word and the word freshly spoken from heaven. That implies special revelation through a spokesman. We come back to that statement later on. I think we have to think like this. When you look at the apostolic period, you have an open canon, right? <coughs> Old Testament's complete, New Testament's still being given. So it's an open canon of Scripture, special revelation still occurring. It's ongoing revelation that is not yet solo scriptura. Certain dynamic here. If you go to the post-apostolic period, closed canon of scripture, no question that there's nothing to be added to the New Testament or the Old Testament, it is shut down. Completed revelation, now fully sola scriptura, applying it to the written word. That, when this revelation is complete, certain dynamic enters into your discussion, into your consideration, which those calling for apostles and prophets have not stopped to consider. Ephesians 4.11 is put forward as the working model. You're going to react immediately, and you should. And the five-fold ministry meaning what? That, that, that a ministry is effective if it has the five gifts, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles. You have to have all of them in the church have a triumphant church, an impacting church, a New Testament church. They push very strongly for the fivefold ministry. In Acts 3.21, Christ held in the heavens until the time of refreshing, and then he, then he will come. But, but it mean, Now, it sounds innocent when I say it like that, but what do they really mean? That our lack of effective ministry is what holds him in the heavens. Now you can see something of the powerful demand here. Listen, let's get up and win the world for Christ. Then he will return and set up his kingdom. If we don't do this, he can't come. And one man actually up in the Washington area said something to the effect, and I don't want to give the name because I'm not sure it was him. God would be foolish to send Christ back to a world in its current state. Now, We've got 
to, we've got to make the church triumphant. We've got to win the structures of society back for Christ. We must get out there and preach and teach and do signs and wonders and prepare the world so that that which holds Christ in the heavens will no longer hold him. Proclamation of restorationism and triumphancy. Is special revelation still taking place today? The basics is God speaks to every Tom, Dick and Harry. If you're a believer, Mary, Jane, Joel, Joan, if you're a believer, you have the right of, for God to speak directly to you. Not through the... You know, when, we, when I used to say, God spoke to me 10 years ago, what, what did I mean? No, 10 years ago, let's get it right, 15 to 20 years ago. Well, what I meant was, and we all understood this when we heard it, as I was reading the scripture, something in that scripture dealt with my heart and life. And I said, God spoke to me. I don't say that today. Can't use that word in a testimony anymore because of its connotations. Now I say, God's word dealt with my heart because they really believe that the voice of God speaks to them it's not an impression it's a revelation and who claims to have revelation more than any others in those circles not just individual but I mean rank of person the, the, the pastor and the teacher the preacher Receiving revelatory interpretation from God to strengthen the authority of the message he delivers. Okay. That is, God told me what this passage said. Uh, George, I was listening to some guy from Canada. Sorry to say. And he, he made the comment. Let's see if I can get it right. Because I remember the guy interviewing him said, oh, deep stuff. Something about he had nowhere to lay his head. Christ had nowhere to lay his head. And he said, that verse puzzled me for years. And God revealed to me the meaning of that passage. It meant that he had no place to put his throne, to set up his kingdom. Because see, head in the Old Testament means you know, the chief of the nations and so on. And so with no place to lay his head, there was nowhere in Palestine that he could set up his palace. Ever heard that deep stuff? <laughs> it's garbage. He didn't get it from heaven, I can assure you of that. Because that inspired word means exactly what it says. He didn't have a fixed abode. That's what it means. Revelatory interpretation. 